official says Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas will not run in upcoming PLO elections. And meanwhile, overnight in Jenin, in the West Bank, the IDF arrests a Hamas militant and clashes erupt. Hundreds of migrants demonstrate and set up temporary shelters outside a Budapest train station after being barred from boarding trains to Germany. And the State Department releases over 7,000 pages of Hillary Clinton's emails, including around 150 messages upgraded to classified status. Today with Lucy Aharish. Good evening and welcome to the news today. Over recent months, rumors have been circling on the intention of Mahmoud Abbas to resign as president of the Palestinian Authority. In the last uh, 24 hours, a Fatah official was quoted in Palestinian media saying Abbas indeed would not run in the PLO election in two weeks, but would remain president of the PA. Meanwhile, an IDF arrest raid in the Janine refugee camp fierce uh, uh, in the West Bank met fierce resistance from Locals. We will look at the whole story and the whole picture, but first, more on Abbas from Eli Ochenberg. Long months of rumors are now reaching their peak as Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas ponders further moves that might be signaling his impending resignation. Less than two weeks after Abbas declared he was quitting of the Palestinian Liberation Organization's Executive Committee, new reports indicate the Palestinian president will also not be running for re-election as the committee's chairman in two weeks and is looking for candidates to replace him. However, Abbas stepping down from his role as the head of the Executive Committee does does not mean he will stop being the PA president. The PLO, Palestine Liberation Organization, and the Palestinian Authority are two separate bodies. The PLO is the official recognized and legitimate institute which represent the Palestinian people, while the Palestinian Authority operates separately and was established following the Oslo Accords as a temporary entity to govern the Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza until an official Palestinian state is formed. Yet the Secretary General of the Fatah Revolutionary Council, Amin Makbul, denied Tuesday that this move is a part of Abbas's intention to leave the political life. Abu Mazen said that he wants to give space for other factions to participate. We asked him to think again, especially in this hard and serious period, and amid the effort by some people to get rid of him. But in the meantime, in the Arab media, indications of an imminent resignation are piling up, with the latest being a report that Abbas updated the Jordanian King Abdullah in their last meeting in Amman that he intends to quit. In early August, it was reported that Abbas has also notified Egyptian President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi of his decision to step down within two months' time. In any case, replacing Abbas will not be an easy task. The Palestinian constitution deems that in order to choose a new president, General elections must be held both in the West Bank and in the Gaza Strip, but the ongoing power struggle between Abbas's Fatah party ruling the West Bank and Hamas ruling the Gaza Strip has prevented any elections for president or parliament since the last ones held back in January 2006. At the moment, it doesn't seem any easing of their political tension can be expected. But if Abbas indeed does go ahead and resign, the political chaos may come to dominate the Fatah movement itself, as many are awaiting for their chance to be the one to inherit the prestigious role of president. And with me here in the studio to discuss this is Foreign Palestinian Minister of uh, Prisoners Affairs, Ashraf al -Azrami. Good evening. Thank you very much for joining me. Also, Senior Middle East Analyst, Abi Sakharov. Good evening. Good evening, Lucy. And Defense and Government Analyst for Arts Daily Newspaper, Amir Oren. Good evening. Good evening, Lucy. Mr. al -Azrami, I will start with you. Um, what is standing behind this decision? And is this de decision means that this is the end for Mahmoud Abbas's political, let's say, career? Yes, I think uh, President Mahmoud Abbas uh, feels uh, um, crisis. He feels a crisis in the uh, peace process, crisis uh, with the, uh, this uh, reconciliation process with Hamas, crisis with the uh, uh, maybe problems between uh, Fatah uh, movement and Fatah members, and with the, the whole situation in the Palestinian Authority. So he uh, reached a situation that there's nothing uh, 
nothing moves at all in this situation. You know, uh, I saw the reaction of one of the Fatah uh, officials that said that, that uh, they urged Mahmoud Abbas not to do it because this is a difficult time. It's a special, a special time where they need to stay united. It always was a difficult time. It always, uh, there was always the need to stay united. There was always the need or people who wanted Mahmoud Abbas out. So what is the difference right now? Well, I'm not sure that there is a difference. Uh, let's start with, yes, he said it last night uh, during the meeting of the Central Committee of uh, Fatah, but there's a difference between the statement and a decision. And you asked about his decision. I'm not sure that there's a decision yet. There's a statement that he's about to leave uh, the, the executive committee of the PLO. Now, is this going to happen in two weeks? I'm not that sure about that. We heard uh, Rasan Shak today saying, this is something rare worried, uh, not realistic, or rare makbul, not accepted by us. Uh, we heard Amin Makbul himself saying we asked him to delay his decision because this is a hard time. So I think what we're going to see is the Fatah officials and many of the other factions inside the PLO surrounding Abbas and urging and begging him, please stay, please stay. So if they are surrounding him and telling him, please stay, please stay, you know, I'm trying to think if this move will make him stronger or weaker, I and think, from what you're saying, it will make him stronger. that the main aim of uh, the meeting of the Central Committee, of the, uh, is the Central Committee of the PLO is to strengthen Abbas is to strengthen his position inside the PLO, and even if not, if he's not going to be a member of the executive committee, at the end of the day, he will be the decision maker. If he will stay in power as the president of the Palestinian Authority, even if there will be negotiations between the PLO and Israel, at the end of the day, when Saib Arikat will need to make decisions, he will ask uh, the approval of Mahmoud Abbas, not anyone else. But he also resigned by, like, uh, yesterday. He said that he's also resigning from Yes, this. but he will run for the executive committee. So basically everything is normal. Uh, everything is still the same. <laughs> well, this is the internal political angle um, about which my two colleagues here are the experts. And uh, obviously, if um, a politician wants to resign sincerely, he does it abruptly. He announces his resignation, he is not coming back, and he doesn't wait for any particular political event and announces two weeks in advance that he's going to do it and, um, in effect, invites people to urge him to, re to remain. So, obviously, this is a tactical move, but there is the international or diplomatic angle, too. When Mahmoud Abbas analyzes the situation, he sees that it's frozen. Nothing is happening. We are uh, going to uh, start an election year in the United States. Uh, in Israel, the government uh, is steady uh, following the elections. It's not uh, falling over the budget or any other crisis yet. So the only asset he has is himself. He can tell President Obama and the European Union and the other powers, listen, if I'm leaving, you know there's going to be chaos. I want you to step in. We are now in the month of September. The UN General Assembly is meeting. We are waiting for some diplomatic moves. The uh, population is restless, and there's going to be political chaos, because all of my um, successors, those who are contending for my throne, are going to fight each other. So please step in and do something so there will be some hope. So if I'm thinking about that, this move, because Really, if a president wants really to resign, he will resign. He will say, starting from tomorrow, I'm not the president anymore. Just handle whatever it is. I am not dealing with that anymore. So what is this? He wants to control the elections. He wants to make sure that the next person who is taking this place is someone that he is choosing? Yes, he, he said, we told the uh, uh, Fatah uh, Central Committee yesterday, that he will leave, but he want to reorganize everything in the PLO and the Fatah movement before he leaves. So he wants to to be sure that everything as he thinks. So, but you know, if, Lucy, I, I'm sorry if I interrupted. Okay. Um, I'm trying to think back. Um, is there has there been anyone, anyone, any politician in the Arab world who voluntarily retired? Ever. 
I'm not talking about fixed terms like they have in Lebanon, six years for president. But when you have people who are in control of a movement or a country, and they are not figureheads. Uh, during uh, uh, Saddam Hussein's yes. early years, you had Ahmed Hassan al-Bakr, who was just a puppet. But if you have a real ruler, no one ever retires. They die in office. We don't know yet. We really don't know yet, and I, I think that we need to wait. I think that the next meeting of the PLO uh, um, Central Committee or Central Council is a very important event, but internally important event, meaning inside the PLO, inside Fatah, it will probably strengthen Abbas's power. I don't see him stepping up down as the president yet. Maybe it will happen towards the end of the year. For the meanwhile, he's showing signs. He's, he's giving all kinds of warning signs to the international community, to the state of Israel, to the U.S., saying, be careful, I might do that, and I'm doing the preparations <coughs> to do that. And maybe these consequences of what might happen the day that he will step down were yesterday in Janine. IDF arrests of Palestinian militants in the West Bank are common, but complications during an operation in the Janine refugee camp over overnight were enough to cause a media blackout that lasted several hours. It ended with a senior Hamas operative in custody and a home demolished as well as several people injured. Shai ben -Ari was in Jenin in the early morning hours. Here's the report. The city of Jenin, which has a turbulent and violent history in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, was again the scene of violence Monday night when a convoy of around 40 Israeli security vehicles entered the city's infamous refugee camp, home to some of the West Bank's most notorious militants, to conduct arrests. We are here in the Janine refugee camp in the northern West Bank, which has always been a hotbed for Palestinian radical activity. In fact, right now, those flashing lights that you can see behind in the distance basically represent Israeli security vehicles, which are conducting, even now, an operation to conduct arrests within the Janine refugee camp. This is in the early morning hours. We're about seven hours at least since the beginning of this operation. Mass IDF arrest operations are a matter of routine these days, but this one was different from most for the sheer volume of resistance which the soldiers encountered. The Israeli forces surrounded the house of a senior Hamas operative. As the arrest was taking place, the army said hundreds of Palestinians threw stones and Molotov cocktails at the soldiers on the scene. The IDF said that 12 Palestinians suffered from tear gas inhalation, with one Israeli policeman sustaining moderate injuries during the clashes. The possibility was entered by friendly fire as being examined. Another factor that sets this event apart was the decision to demolish the home of the Hamas operative, Majdi Abu al-Heja. What you see here behind me is the remains of the Abu al-Heja house, the family home here, which was destroyed overnight during a security operation by the IDF and other Israeli security forces. One person, Majdi al-Heja, was taken into custody. Four other members of his family were also taken into custody, interrogated, and then released. After an hour of interrogation, they released the others, but they took Majdi away. Afterwards, they began destroying the house. They used bulldozers and also fired a missile at the building. About 15 soldiers took part in the demolition. Majdi Abu al -Hajj is a senior member of Hamas's military wing in the West Bank, and this was not the first attempt to arrest him. Home demolitions are not a new tactic, but Israel has refrained from using it recently. In the past, it has been used as a measure of deterrence against terror. When questioned, an IDF source refused to elaborate on why the Abu al Heja home was destroyed. We call on the citizens of the world to come and see the suffering of the Palestinian people. All this destruction is unimportant. It can be rebuilt. It's a small price to pay for the sake of Palestine. Many in Israel have questioned whether home demolitions of terrorists do not do more harm than good to the general security of Israeli citizens. Is it part maybe of the scenario or, or let's say the consequences that we might see in the future if Mahmoud Abbas will step down? Well, there's no doubt that if he will step down, we will see an escalation on the ground. I think that one of the main reasons for why the situation is partially calm or I would say even uh, very calm comparing to other areas, uh, other eras that we've seen in the past is the Palestinian Authority and Mahmoud Abbas himself that is saying time after time, no for a third intifada, no, no for a third uprising, no for violence. And he <laughs> emphasizes again and again and again. And without Abbas, the situation is going to be completely different. Although yesterday we heard Mahmoud Zahar saying, uh, the spokesman of Hamas saying that, that these are the signs of a third intifada. These are 
what? It's the terror that Mahmoud Abbas is not able to actually contain in the West Bank? This is the, the aim of uh, Hamas movement. Hamas uh, wants to keep uh, Gaza Strip uh, calm and uh, secure everything with the Israeli side to be all right. But in the West Bank, they want to uh, make uprising, make uh, maybe uh, chaos, everything related to the Palestinian Authority, because Hamas isn't respons responsible of the uh, West Bank. So it is in favor of Hamas to do uh, problems in the uh, West Bank. But I think that Hamas also will pay the price if there is a chaos in the West Bank, because if there is a chaos in the West Bank and the clashes and people uh, will kill, Hamas will be involved certainly of this uh, uh, circle of violence. Yesterday's operation was, you know, maybe it was um, the big, uh, biggest example for the security coordination between Israel and the Palestinian Authority, which means that on the ground, Israel and the Palestinian Authority are still cooperating to prevent terror from getting out of the West Bank. That's very true, and uh, when we speak about uh, Mahmoud Abbas and what might happen on the ground uh, after if he leaves, the security forces is a major ingredient in this equation. And uh, the question of how they will behave vis-a-vis -vis the various contenders has to do with the question of the succession. If the, it is, the, the view of the experts here is that if it is an orderly succession, someone that Mahmoud Abbas chooses or is being elected in a proper way, the security forces will obey him. But if not, they might step in. You might see something along a military coup. Um, but uh, for the time being, yes, they are cooperating. People will say collaborating with the Israeli Defense Forces. What happened last night was probably a routine operation which went wrong on two levels. One is that uh, one border policeman uh, was shot by his uh, colleagues. Um, as you know, there is a fantastic television series co-created by Avi Sahar of here, Fauda, being shown on Israeli screens. Uh, if one watches I, it, one knows. I just, yeah, I have to did. tell you that that was the first thing that came uh, came into my mind when I but saw it. But he's too modest to, to uh, remind you of it, so I will um, instead. But in any event, the other uh, point is that usually um, it goes on without any trouble. Even last night, in addition to this particular person, 12 others were picked up throughout the West Bank and the uh, Jordan Valley with no incident. But here, the 300 Palestinians who circled the force and threw stones and Molotov cocktails, this is a harbinger of what might happen if the population is restless. Uh, let's talk about uh, what Pauli Mordechai, the security coordinator for the IDF, uh, spoke today that Hamas basically is taking the cement that is getting into the Gaza Strip to build more uh, tunnels. This is something obvious. We didn't think that it's not actually happening on the ground. This was this case was a bit different. Uh, uh, General uh, uh, Mordechai didn't elaborate about that, but what he meant to say was that Hamas yesterday went from one carpenter to the, the other in Gaza Strip picking up all the woods uh, that there was there in order to use it uh, for the tunnels instead of the cement. Instead of the, the, the cement that Israel start from giving to Hamas yes. almost directly, so now they're picking up all the wood that exists in Gaza. They even cut trees inside Gaza in order to use them. Now, they're short of wood because Israel made all kinds of restrictions of entrance of wood into the Gaza Strip, and this is why Hamas acted and operated last night, sent their military wing to pick up wood from each and every carpenter almost in the Gaza Strip. And at the end of the day, of course, instead of people, uh, citizens that will get it, will, will receive it, Hamas is the one. I to want to ask you before we're finishing, gentlemen, about, uh, let's say, the policy of turning doors uh, uh, in the West Bank. Uh, because when we are receiving each and every morning the messages from the IDF and we're seeing the amount of people that are being arrested each and every day in the West Bank, you know, I'm asking myself, are all of those people are staying there and how it's actually mm, create what is the situation that is uh, the, being created in the west bank it, when they're seeing it is generated by intelligence it is supposed to generate more intelligence if the israeli security service the uh, shabak 
gets a piece of information which it wants to validate. It picks up the person or it asks the Israeli Defense Forces to please step in and pick him up for questioning. Usually, uh, they then take the next piece of information and go to pick up the next, the person, next person in order to foil a terror attack. The majority of them uh, are released normally, but the, uh, as uh, my colleague here said, the uh, uh, Shabak uh, wants to have information from these people who will uh, who, who uh, arrest them all the time. So it is it is situation that the Israeli security services all the time collect people to collect information of them and after that release the majority of them who aren't involved in any kind of action against the Israelis. It's a matter of priorities. Uh, Their top priority is foiling terror attacks, even though they know that this could cause resentment uh, in the population. I will just uh, right now uh, say that uh, Channel 1, Israeli Channel 1, is uh, saying and quoting Mahmoud Abbas, saying that he's 80 years old, he is tired, and he is uh, opening the place for a younger generation, but he's not stepping down yet. So, uh, so let's meet in 10, same, in 10 years when he's 19, perhaps. Uh, <laughs> yes. He'll feel same, better. Same. Shimon but different. Shimon Peres. Yes, oh, he still have 10 years, so it's okay. Gentlemen, thank you very, very much for this. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. The United Nations confirmed that a temple in the Asian Syrian city of Palmyra has been destroyed after earlier reports of an explosion at the Temple of Bell held by militants from Islamic State terror group. UN satellite analysis say the satellite image shows almost nothing remains. Last week, it was confirmed that another site at the Palmyra, the Baal Shamin Temple, had been blown up. IS Milton seized control of the city in May, sparking fears for the World Heritage Site. Over the last week's deep-seated frustrations over Lebanon's political stalemate and a crumbling infrastructure have come to the surface over a garbage crisis. It continued today when dozens of activists stormed the Environment Ministry. Elio Holmberg has the latest. The youth stink Lebanese protests are intensifying as on Tuesday the anti-government protesters stormed the environment ministry in Beirut, calling on Environment Minister Mohamed Mahnouk to resign. We are here. We took the ministry from the corrupted people who are occupying it and we're not leaving from here until the minister resigns. It's as simple as that. Lebanon has been hit by a series of protests against the government ignited by a waste crisis in the country. In recent weeks, the demonstrations turned more and more political and violent as protesters took the streets of the Lebanese capital, calling on the government to resign due to what they say is incompetence and corruption. I'm here today because my anger is so huge I couldn't sit at home. I came to listen to the others who share this anger. We shouldn't nag without doing anything. At least my voice will reach a single politician who is misusing power. Last Tuesday, a cabinet meeting aimed at finding solutions to the deteriorating crisis ended without result as six ministers walked out after new waste management contracts were rejected as too expensive. The ministers are from the political wing of the Hezbollah organization and from the Free Patriotic Movement, which supports it, and are backing the demonstrations, eager to bring down the government. The political structure in Lebanon is highly sensitive, having a built-in mechanism aimed at securing sectarian representation. But the national unity government, led by the Lebanese Prime Minister Tamam Salam, has practically been paralyzed since it took office last year due to the deep sectarian rivalries. Four years ago, when the the Arab Spring swayed the Middle East, Lebanon managed to remain stable. Now, it seems the winds of change are blowing in the direction of the cedar country as well. Yes, and with me right now here in the, the studio, senior Middle East analyst Ali Waqid. Good evening. Thank you very much uh, for joining me. So this uh, crisis apparently is not because of garbage. The garbage is only the trigger, of course, uh, uh, Lucy. The corruption is the uh, is the issue. The fact that the uh, Lebanese institutions are uh, are not able uh, more than for more than one year uh, to elect a, a president, and there is a freeze in the uh, political uh, situation, and the fact of, of this duality between the Al Mustakbal and uh, Hezbollah on the other uh, hand, and of course the allies of such of the uh, camp within the Christian uh, uh, community are. Uh, 
paralyzing uh, the country, and uh, the, the garbage was only the trigger to call the people to get down uh, to the streets. And when they call, uh, you stink. It's not only for the garbage. It's most for the uh, politicians and more. Let's try to um, understand and analyze what is happening right now in the Lebanese government, because uh, if we were talking all this time about Syria, about Iraq, about Libya, about all the mess in the Middle East, Lebanon was in one way or another kind of a stepped um, f step down from the being in the in the focus of the headlines what is happening right now that might actually deteriorate the situation and that they will be joined to the mess well uh, uh, two things first of all I'm not 100 uh, percent uh, sure that uh, Lebanese uh, Lebanon was uh, stepped out of this uh, whole mess in the Arab world because since more than uh, two years uh, publicly uh, Hezbollah is officially and uh, publicly and deeply involved in the Syrian uh, crisis and there is this uh, amazing flu of uh, migrants from Syria uh, uh, to Lebanon Lebanon and the impact over uh, uh, Lebanon, especially in north of Lebanon, Tripoli, the clashes between Sunnis and Alawites uh, uh, came uh, uh, to uh, to Lebanon. What is happening is that uh, the Lebanese are uh, seeing the political institutions uh, paralyzed, are seeing uh, the division uh, paralyzing in uh, the the day-to-day -day life of the of the people, and and we are seeing the garbage spilling in the uh, in the streets because of the fact that Hezbollah camp is considering that the company that 10 years ago received the contract of the state was a company close to Saad al-Hariri, the uh, former uh, prime minister of the al-Mustaqbal Sunnit camp, and now they want that the company will be uh, 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 will be more uh, close to the other uh, Shiite uh, uh, camp, and this given uh, give and take between the different uh, uh, different uh, groups and blocks in in uh, in uh, in Lebanon, the the, the Lebanese uh, people are fed up with this uh, uh, system. They know that this is the source of the corruption, the corruption that have an impact over the unemployment in uh, in Lebanon, over the fact that many young uh, uh, Lebanese, there is a very high percentage, around uh, uh, more than a third uh, of the uh, youth in, in Lebanon prefer to, to leave uh, uh, the country. And they think that they are paying the prices of deals between politicians. You know, what is beautiful in these images, and I will say beautiful in one way or another, is that we are seeing women and men is stepping and going on the streets together and actually protesting, unlike other images. And women and men are now, while we are talking, evacuated from the Ministry of Environment in Lebanon after occupying for a while uh, the, uh, the bureaus of the uh, ministry. Ali Waka, thank you very much you. Uh, for this. We're going out for a small break, two minutes, and I'll be back. Fatah official says Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas will not run in upcoming PLO elections. And meanwhile, overnight in Janine in the West Bank, the IDF arrests a Hamas militant and clashes erupt. Hundreds of migrants demonstrate and set up temporary shelters outside a Budapest train station after being barred from boarding trains to Germany. And the State Department releases over 7,000 pages of Hillary Clinton's emails, including around 150 messages upgraded to classified status. Welcome back. Over 350,000 migrants have risked their lives attempting to cross the Mediterranean this year. And as Europe tries to cope, German Chancellor Angela Merkel and Spanish Prime Minister Mariano Rajoy are pushing for defined countries to safe origin to take in migrants. Or Shapira has more. Europe saw one of its most dramatic days since the migration crisis began. More than 3,600 migrants, the largest daily number this year, have reached Vienna by train. Some spoke of the difficulties they face on their way to Western Europe. We saw the death, like Syria. They put us in jail, they make us sleep, they don't give us food or water. Uh, anyone uh, try to escape, they, uh, they hate us. And uh, the police, like Syrian. <laughs> Meanwhile, in Budapest, hundreds of angry migrants protested after Hungary closed the Keledi railway station. 
This is a complete change of policy by the Hungarian authorities, who only a day beforehand let undocumented migrants move to Germany. And our our uh, our requests requests are very very simple. Just we need re, uh, just release, just to pass Hungary. German Chancellor Angela Merkel said Syrian refugees are welcome in Germany, considering the horrific situation in their country of origin. But Merkel also pointed out that Germany cannot be the only European country to pay the price. I think we should just work on a joint asylum policy in Europe, just like we had discussed with Spain instead of accusing each other. Instead, we must change something. This includes these hotspots, registration centers, which need to be set up quickly. These latest events are also encouraging many Germans and Austrians to volunteer to help the new migrants with food and aid. But now Europe's countries have to decide on their next step as the wave of migrants continues to storm the continent. And with us uh, right now from Budapest, Hungary, is uh, Babar Bloch, uh, UNHR spokesman at the Central Europe. Good evening. Thank you very much for joining me. Thank you. So maybe what we're looking at today, the reaction of Hungary is in the most, I think, ideas or the most, uh, if I'm thinking about it, this is not humane to prevent people from actually getting up or actually find a shelter. This is not humane. This is the plan, how to deal with migrants in Hungary? I mean, the questions are the same that we keep asking and looking for and searching. The issue is uh, that there are over a thousand people that have been staying at this train station for too long. For the last few days, they were not being able or allowed to board trains. Uh, and these are asylum seekers and refugees who are just stuck, who arrive here. And then yesterday, there was a wave that people were allowed to go and take the train. Uh, so there were people who went, and this morning, the expectation from these refugees and asylum seeker was that probably they would be allowed again. So that's why you saw all the scenes of frustration and agitation this morning, that it has now stopped. Uh, the, the train station was shut down uh, uh, this morning. I have heard that it has resumed some movement, but asylum seekers and refugees are not allowed to board the trains again. You know, uh, we are seeing today that Angela Merkel basically is trying to create some kind of a plan for all the migrants in Europe, maybe to tell to the all EU to put their hands together and try to come up with some kind of a solution. There is no plan in Hungary. There is no nothing that the government is actually even, even knows what and how to start doing. Yeah, I mean, the plan which is missing is a European plan which is missing, and Hungary is part of, of the European Union. Uh, and that has been exactly our ask. Uh, these people are refugees fleeing Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, majority of them. They need human treatment. As you mentioned yourself in the first question, I have been at the border yesterday. I have seen in the 35 degrees heat women, children, and kids arriving, walking 12 hours, 14 hours, exhausted. So they need proper reception. The problem Europe-wide is there is inadequate and uneven reception among the European Union countries. They need to come up with a solution, a solution which is right for the world's most vulnerable. You know, I'm trying to think from uh, the people who live in Europe, when they're seeing this amount of uh, immigrants coming to their countries, you don't think that uh, maybe it's understood why people uh, are afraid to uh, uh, try and, and imagine a life with all these migrants living with them? I think the problem is that there needs to be an understanding. I mean, you, when you have a world on fire, wherever you look, there are crises, there's conflict. So people will look for search, will, will search for safety. And the people who are arriving here, they are not the perpetrators, they are the victims of these wars. And that's why they are coming to Europe looking for safety. We're looking for that understanding. And then we are also asking uh, the politicians, you know, it's a humanitarian issue, it's a refugee crisis. Don't play politics on this. 
these people need immediate assistance and help right now. And apart from that, not everyone is coming to Europe. 300,000 have come this year, yes, but there are 4 million Syrian refugees in the region and as well in, in other areas globally. We have 20 million refugees. And Europe, we have used Europe as an advocate on refugee issues for too long. Now that the problem has come home, we were not expecting that it would be dealt like this. Yes, uh, thank you very, very much uh, for this conversation with us. Thank you. You're thank you. Yes, and two more Ukrainian National Guardsmen have died over of uh, their wounds suffered in yesterday's clashes outside Parliament, the worst unrest in Kiev since the uprising that ousted the president in early 2014. Charles Bibelzer has the latest. Amateur video taken outside of Ukraine's parliament purporting to show a suspect hurling a grenade, which killed at least three and injured some 140 others on Monday. The incident took place during clashes sparked by nationalist protesters opposed to a proposed law giving more autonomy to rebel-held areas in the country's east. As a citizen of the country, I demand, according to Article 348 of the Criminal Code of Ukraine, a life sentence for the man who threw the grenade. The riot erupted after 265 deputies voted in favor of the bill, 39 more than that required to pass, at a raucous session. The second reading of the legislation is set for later this year and will need a two-thirds majority of 450 lawmakers. While Ukraine's president condemned the deadly violence, he defended the constitutional reforms. We want to demonstrate to the whole world and to the whole pro-Ukrainian coalition that Ukraine is very responsible to implement all the obligations we signed in February in Minsk. On contrary, Russia do not do anything. And that's why it would be absolutely clear picture for the whole world. Meanwhile, in an effort to shore up the tenuous ceasefire, Kiev and Russian separatists agreed during talks last week to hold their fire beginning Tuesday. The proposal got a positive response practically from all sides. And there is hope that as of September the 1st, we will manage to stop all the shelling. More than 6,800 people have been killed since violence broke out way back in April 2014, after popular demonstrations toppled a pro-Moscow president and Russia moved to annex Crimea. While the sides agreed to a truce this past February, sporadic fighting has continued. And right now with me is uh, journalist Alex Klaymenov in Kiev. Good evening. Thank you very much for joining me. Uh, Alex, everybody's talking about a ceasefire. What are the chances that this ceasefire will actually hold this time? Because all the other times it didn't. Well, every time you talk about the situation in Ukraine, you have to remember that this conflict in the Ukrainian East is not something that had natural causes in the first place. This is an artificially manufactured conflict, which is pretty much ruled from the outside. So every time that there is a ceasefire, it will hold if the players who are engaged in the ceasefire will somehow benefit from it. If you analyze Ukraine's position, Ukraine is always interested in having a ceasefire because even though uh, some of the voices in the Ukrainian parliament, especially these nationalist organizations, they call moves um, uh, towards a ceasefire treason because they say we need to liberate these territories. Actually, every time that there is a ceasefire, it benefits Ukraine because Ukrainian men and women who are fighting on the front lines are not being killed and also the Ukrainian citizens in the occupied territory are also not being killed. Yeah, but uh, Alex, uh, like, if you are uh, a pro a ceasefire and you want to get to some kind of a, an agreement, why they're not uh, supporting Poroshenko in this move? Well, uh, Right now, that the other side has also agreed to a ceasefire, you have to analyze why it is uh, working for them. Uh, we have the United Nations General Assembly coming up very soon, and in Russia, we will be taking up uh, the leading position at the Secu UN Security Council. And of course, it is very good for Russia that uh, there is no fighting in Ukraine happening before the General Assembly. Uh, we have heard many times leaders of the so called Donetsk People's Republic say that they want to go as far as Kiev, they want to liberate all of Ukraine. 
Ukrainian south, even capture the Ukrainian capital. So it is very hard to believe that they really want the, the truce to, to take place. But uh, right now, it is beneficial for them and for, obviously, for people in the Kremlin. So hopefully it will hold. Yes, Alex Klaymenov, thank you very, very much for this. Yes, and uh, we're going to the United States. Uh, in the latest round of emails released by the U.S. State Department from former Secretary, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton's tenure, it uh, has uh, been revealed that aides to Clinton complains about the limitations of using emails to discuss sensitive diplomatic information. The State Department made public over 7,000 pages of Clinton's emails last night, including about 150 emails that were sent censored prior to their release because they contain information now deemed classified. Charles Bilizer has more. An email scandal continues to hover like a cloud over Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign. Some 150 correspondences from her 2009 to 2013 tenure as Secretary of State have retroactively been classified, further raising suspicion she improperly handled sensitive information on a private as opposed to official server. We have upgraded uh, some, uh, uh, a number of these uh, these. And what's your emails? estimate of how many? Um, you say there's 7,000 pages, how many? Right, and I don't want to, you know, I, again, it's, you know, until we release it, we don't have a firm number. Uh, I, I think it's somewhere around 150. Last month, 63 other emails were also upgraded, rendering them inaccessible to the public. Critics contend that Clinton used a private server to avoid political scrutiny. They also charge she took information out of supposedly secure systems and onto an unauthorized network that could be hacked. The Democratic presidential frontrunner denies any wrongdoing. A personal account or a government account. I did not send classified material and I did not receive any material that was marked or designated classified, which is the way you know whether something is. Nevertheless, the FBI has launched an investigation into the matter, and in August, the intelligence community's inspector general told Congress that he discovered two emails sent to Clinton that contained top-secret and sensitive compartmented information, the government's highest levels of classification. The inspector general added that Clinton's private server could potentially be holding hundreds of classified emails, some of which include information derived from U.S. intelligence agencies. And with me to discuss about this is correspondent Charles Bilizer. Good evening. Hi, Lucy. You know, um, after we said, okay, it's only email, it's only a server, different... Let's think about it, and we're thinking about it a lot, and you're saying, okay, you can send 50, you can send 100 emails not from the government server, but how many? Over 60,000. Over 60,000 60, emails 000 from your private server, this from is insane. From a private server, 30,000 of which were wiped out entirely because Clinton deemed them personal and private. That being said, she was forced to hand over an additional 30,000 odd emails to the State Department, which have been released now in tranches. What was she thinking? Because she is the Secretary of State of the United States of America. What was she thinking? I can't tell you what she was thinking, but what I can tell you is what her critics accuse her of. That is that she wanted to avoid uh, any political uh, limelight. She wanted to avoid that scrutiny. And also, she wanted basically, in order to have that kind of privacy, in order to maintain more of a private persona for herself. But you know, we're talking about this because it's causing her a lot of trouble in the polls. And because it's actually can she can she can lose the the, the presidential campaign absolutely uh, and it's more than that and we know that Clinton's numbers she's tracking at the lowest percentage under 50 that she's basically had since these polls started tracking her candidacy in 2012 that being said she has a much bigger issue here this is becoming a legal issue the FD, FBI has opened an investigation and as I cited in the piece the inspector general of the intelligence community found two emails that contained 
not classified information or sensitive information, top secret information. Now, what's important to note is that these two emails came from a pool, a batch of only 40. So if we use that ratio, okay, 5%, and we extrapolate from the whole pool of 30,000 emails that she submitted to the state, she could be sitting on 1,500 or more highly, highly class classified information. Which leads to, well, we will end up with... It, it could lead to a criminal indictments, quite frankly. I'd be, I would be very surprised if against her directly, not as much surprised about if... Uh, her inner circle was targeted. So what do you think? Do you think that uh, uh, the night that we will uh, do this a special edition of the president, uh, presidential elections, we might say, and the president of the United States is Donald Trump? It absolutely could. Um, on the Democratic side, this is also because Hillary is having these types of problems. You're basically seeing Biden mentioned as well. Uh, Trump has come out against Hillary. If Hillary is out of the contest, I think it will boost his candidacy. You know, yesterday we didn't speak about uh, Kanye West, uh, uh, Kanye. I think, <laughs> 2020. Yeah. What do you think about that? I, I, I will reiterate what I said to you in private when I left the studio. If we have a Donald Trump versus Kanye West head-to-head -head face off in 2020, I'm joining the circus. <laughs> I wonder what uh, uh, Kardashian will wear. For first lady. Uh, for first lady. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. Bad image in my mouth. Uh, yeah. Charles Bullwizzer, thank you very much thank for this you for me, God damn it. Okay, something else. In connection with uh, recent terror events uh, in the West Bank and East Jerusalem, Israeli GPS application ways elected to make a major change in its route with a guide avoiding areas controlled by the Palestinian Authority. Matthias Imbar and Uri Shapiro report. We're here at Mount Scopus and decided to go towards the Armona Natsiv Promenade in East Jerusalem, 2.6 kilometers from here, to see if the application ways distinguishes between routes under Israeli and Palestinian control. Once in the car, according to the application, one only has to tick the proper box to drive solely on Israeli roads. Now, logically, we should drive for about 27 minutes, so let's see. Around midday in August in Jerusalem, the traffic should be dense between the never-ending red traffic lights, the traffic jams, and seeing that we are driving on road number one, which is the main road connecting the south to the north of the country, driving fast is rather difficult. Once at the destination, we have to build up our motivation again. Once more, we have to drive across the city to get to Mount Scopus. So let's go. As we untick the box that says avoid territories under Palestinian control, we submit a request to get to the same destination as we did previously. That is to say, a nice drive to Armon Hanatsiv. But here, surprise! The time it will take us to get there has miraculously decreased from previously predicted 27 minutes to 18 minutes. As we get to the slope leading to the Silwan neighborhood, we find ourselves in the center of East Jerusalem, where young Muslims have been violently confronting the Israeli security forces for the past few months. Let's test the application to see if ways will let us back up our tracks. No doubt possible. According to the app, there is no Israeli road around. An affirmation contested by Nir Barkat, the mayor of Jerusalem, in the following press release. Waze's definition of some of the areas in Jerusalem as being part of the Palestinian Authority has no basis and is inadmissible. I'm asking Waze's directors not to turn a technological app into a political tool. Arya King, his municipal councillor, goes even farther. As long as they don't clear the issue, I see no reason to use this application. We will start using it again when they finally decide to listen to the mayor of Jerusalem and to the police. Meanwhile, one has to conclude what ways has to decide not to go back on its decision de facto to divide Jerusalem. Officially, this measure has taken for security reasons. However, this reason has been hard to confirm since Suez has refused to comment on the matter. To us, one thing is sure, though. It was almost impossible to know exactly when we crossed this technological frontier to find ourselves driving in the streets of Ras al-Amud, Silwan, Jabal or Mukaber. 
And from Ways to Google, financial analyst Lionel Friedfeld is here with me to speak about that. Good evening. Good evening, Lucy. So uh, not only that uh, Google is uh, putting a new logo out, but it's also in the medical business. Exactly. They just decided now to tie it up with you know, a pharmaceutical company called Sanofi, one of the giants of the industry. Basically, they're going to fight against diabetes. Uh, basically, Google is being to bring the expertise that they have to analytics, bringing data, being in touch with people on a mobile phone, and uh, Sanofi is going to bring the expertise, the medical expertise, to fight against diabetes. Basically, we're speaking about more than 350 million people actually, uh, you know, like suffer from diabetes, you know, according to uh, the World's Organization. Uh, and basically, this is a huge step for Google going forward, because if you remember, Google they already started to work into electrical car. They're also doing kind of a broadband internet for the population. So it's a new venture for Google. And so how much money they're going to gain from this? I think all of it, you know, Google is really today, uh, you know, has a huge a database, you know, they connected on a daily basis with everybody, with Google Play, with the cell phone, with the computer, so they know exactly. So they're going to apply, you know, like the data science, uh, actually, to the medical world, and actually, uh, all, everybody will benefit from it. In this case, will be people suffering from diabetes. Oh, well, this, is, uh, this sounds um, amazing, amazing, but another way for Google to control our lives. Definitely Google, you can see, is coming a large conglomerate dealing with everything in our life. More control for them, more money for them, and for us, easy life, I think. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, Lionel Friedfeld, thank you very thank much. Thank you, Mrs. And uh, we're going for the Catholic uh, Church uh, shift, although a temporary one, uh, in uh, the issue of uh, abortions. Pope Francis has called on priests to pardon women who have abortions and the doctors who perform them during the upcoming Jubilee year. In a message outlining special measures for the Jubilee, Francis said he knew that while, quote, the tragedy of abortion is experienced by some with a superficial awareness many others believe that they have no other option the jubilee year is traditionally a period for remission and forgiveness and look who's here someone who's singing but who's you, here? You, just you don't notice how good he sings oh yes really. you didn't hear how good he sings the, do you want to sing a little the, bit the, jonathan reagan no 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 no, no. some so, people in the control room are don't don't let him sing don't when let the them sing when they the cameras roll yeah they were complaining yes yes yeah. okay so well let's talk about matches yes a, a terrible terrible story about transfers we spoke of transfers here the past few days and one of the biggest transfers of the summer was supposed to be David De Gea, the mm. goalkeeper moving from Manchester United to Real Madrid, mm -hmm. two of the biggest clubs in Europe. They have negotiated this deal for nearly two months, finally reached a deal in the last minutes of the last, uh, uh, the, on the last day. The transfer did not work because the file sent from Manchester on the computer, you know this thing? Chick, 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 chick. Okay, that's the people, supposed to work. The people in Madrid could not open the file. When they did open the file, the deadline was already over. Are you it sounds me? like a, a stupid sore story from the 80s. It's, when, it's like... Yes. Maybe they should have sent it with a pigeon. Uh, maybe. Or with... Uh, no, it sounds like when you're not doing your homework and you're telling uh, the dog ate my yes, homework. The, yes, I could so not open could the not file. Open. This is a club that spends hundreds of millions of euros on transfers and they could not open a file. So, uh, I have to tell you a story. A few, a few years ago, an Israeli club, Maccabi Haifa, they fielded a player who could not play because they did not see the facts sent from UEFA. They were bashed by the Israeli media for all the, the right reasons. This is happening a far worse story to Manchester United and Real Madrid. Uh, so I, I think that it's a uh, human mistake. It's a human mistake, but clubs that spend hundreds and hundreds and millions of euros, two of the biggest clubs in the world, they cannot afford doing ah uh, details, 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 yeah. Details. It will never happen to us. Yeah, no, we can open a file yeah, in a computer. Check. Transfer us. Yes, it's like a, you know, open, open. Uh, you know, O P E N, open. Open. Abre in Spanish, abre. Spanish and abre. But you said Abrelo. open. You yes. said open, and we're talking. Ah, about that's the problem. Um, yes. Ah, ah, now I understand. <laughs> so let's talk about the U.S. Open. The U.S. Open. Last year's finalist, Kei Nishikori, he surprised everybody by reaching the final uh, last year. He will not do it again because he lost in the first round. Oh. Ah, 
that's it? He lost it, yes, <laughs> but this is something that has not happened in the US Open since 1991. 24 years, it was Andre Agassi back then. He, he lost in the final of 1990 and then did not make it past the first round in uh, 1991. Again, it happened now. Fourth round, Kenny Shikori is out. It's something that should not happen in the first round. Yes, we do not expect Kenny Shikori to go to the finals when there's uh, Federer and Djokovic and Murray around, maybe even Nadal. But losing in the first round, he actually had two match points in the fourth set. He lost them and then went to lose the game in oh. five sets. Let's uh, talk about bizarre stuff. Yes, yes, I see the smile. This is, uh, I bring a lot of bizarre championships. Yeah. I don't know if I've excelled better than this. Oh it's God. the World Championship Gravy Wrestling. What? I'll say it again. World Championship in Gravy Wrestling. Now, yes, uh, we all like gravy. It's nice when you put it on mashed of potatoes. Course. Yes, wrestling in gravy, Ew. not so sure. Ew. And, and plus, you know, you fall into gravy. If you, a, gra a little, a little bit of gravy is nice. Falling into gravy, it's, it's, comme si, uh, comme ça. Yeah, you don't want to be someone to cut. Look at that. Oh <laughs> my god. <laughs> oh my god. Yes, and the wrestling. And I don't want to smell you like gravy. So I'm. Um, um, so I will withdraw from next year's okay, gravy championship. That's it. They, they just don't. Because I was so good this year. I, I almost made it to the like Kei Nishikori. The almost made it to the final. <laughs> almost there. Jonathan Riker, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Lucy. <laughs> Uh, yes, and uh, we're going out for a break. An update from our news desk. We will go for a chicken soup uh, contest, and then we will be back just after 14 minutes. Just don't go anywhere. Just update, and we will be back. Welcome back to the news today. Some say that football is a religion, but in Israel, religion and football collide in a different way. Since Israel was founded, most of the professional football games were played on Saturdays. But recently, the Tel Aviv Labor Court ruled that Saturday football games in Israel were illegal because the teams do not have a permit to engage in their profession on Saturday, the Sabbath, as the law requires. Those permits are issued by the economy minister, currently Ali Adeli, from the ultra-religious party Shas. The Israeli Football Association demanded that those permits will be given and if not threatened heads of the association that they would suspend games altogether. This issue brings up the old tension between the secular and religious population in Israel and to understand more about that, here is with me Professor of Political Science Dr. Hani Zubeda. I lose it. And you don't like football at all? No, not at all. <laughs> um, I just write about it. My son plays. I, no, no, no. Uh, you don't. You, you don't understand <laughs> anything on, on football. And of course, Dov Lipman, political analyst and former member of Israel Parliament, Yashatid Party. Good evening. Good to be here, and also a big sports fan. B big sports fan. So, what do you think about that? Should they play it on Shabbat, or should they? So I'll make a strong opening statement, okay. and I'll say my ultimate goal would be that no one, any athlete who wants to be religious and keep the Shabbat in a Jewish state should be able to do so, and a Jewish state should be able to accommodate that. However, I don't think that should come from the religious side forcing it on the secular side. I think it's time for a real conversation between the two sides to give room on both sides. For example, we should say, no soccer on Shabbat, but we'll give transportation on Shabbat for the secular side, which doesn't have it. Come with a new contract together in unity and not one side trying to beat the other side over the head. You know, I'm, I'm looking at that. This is the Jewish country. A Jewish country, of course, part of the Jewish religion is to keep Shabbat. When this definition is uh, part of the the Israel state, eventually let, let, it will collide. Let me remind you, the first Prime Minister of Israel, David Ben-Gurion, was not forced to give the status quo agreement to the ultra-Orthodox. He gave it from his own will to uh, Chazon Ish, the Orthodox rabbi, ultra-Orthodox rabbi, not Zionist uh, um, um, religious rabbi, ultra-Orthodox rabbi, and in that it was stated that the Shabbat would be preserved in the state of Israel. Now. It's not Arya Deri. It's not the problem of the Minister of Economy. Every religious member of the government can say, if you play on Shabbat, you break the law. That's the law. If you don't like it, change the law. The government doesn't have enough hands 
to change the law right now. They don't, they don't have enough hands or they are afraid from the orthodox, uh, let's say, parties in Israel or the orthodox community. There's no doubt that the ultra-orthodox parties and the ministers will not lend a hand to anything which they view as desecrating the Shabbat, the Sabbath, or lending a hand towards secular people to do so. I believe that's unfortunate, meaning I think we have to have the conversation. For 67 years, we've punted, I'll use a sports reference, on this question. Yeah, but they are, they are controlling, sport, they're, they're controlling right now the government, and they are basically, uh, if they won't agree to do something, this government won't you be won't. able to last. You so can't hold the stick from both sides. That, that, that's the deal. You can't eat the cake and leave it a whole. If this is a Jewish state, you need the ultra orthodox to give you the kosher stamp on the Jewish on a lot state. Of things. Yes, one of them is the Shabbat. There's a there's a different approach to that. Uh, the Minister of Interior, Sylvan Shalom, has a proposal mm, right. of law for a few years in which you would like to extend the weekend, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Like so. Europe, like all over the world. Good <laughs> thing, uh, Sylvan. We we. we a group of us, intellectuals, supported that. Why? Because you have to remember, usually, most of the people who need to have arrangements uh, do that on Friday. Those are most of the people in Israel who are like lower classes. Yes. They don't have the time to do it any other Very way because weekend. they work too much. Now, the question which Dov uh, raised, and, and is a valid question or statement, those who do not want to play on Saturday should have the option, however they want. Because Some, if, if they play in the Premier League, the Israeli Premier League, they won't have that option. If will, uh, I listened to Eyal Berkovitz uh, uh, saying that uh, a player that doesn't want to play on Shabbat, he should not be a football player. He yeah, should well, not play. Uh, Eyal Berkovitz uh, is not the sharpest knife in the drawer. Uh, I can tell you I can tell you in the Knesset uh, the number of parents that turn to me, my son is a swimmer, my son is a tennis player, and we are Shomer Shabbat, we keep the uh, Sabbath, and they can't. the championship games are on the Saturday. We can't do it. I, I think we have to find a way to enable religious people, a high percentage, and it's growing in this country, are religiously observant. I do agree very much with Hani that the ultimate solution has to do with another day off. I sat with someone secular, a minister, uh, within the last two weeks on this issue, and he said, we just don't have another day. That's the problem. He said, I want to help the religious here, but there's no other day. And if we work on this Sunday issue, then all of a sudden that opens up the possibility for even secular people to say, you know what, let's have the games on Sunday, and let's let the Sabbath be the Sabbath. Dove, how it worked for you uh, being part in Yeshatid party, when you are a religious uh, man, you are coming from uh, uh, religious views, and you are in a party that um, was not able, let's say, maybe sometimes to see the other side, to see the religious side. How did it work uh, with you? When I met with Yair Lapid, the founder of the party, the first time, we sat and he said on every issue of religion and state, we will sit together as a group around a table. It'll be a very difficult process, but we will come to understandings and compromise, and until all 19 of us in the Knesset signed off on it, we're not moving forward. And Shabbat is an example. We sat down on the issue of buses on Shabbat, on the Sabbath day, and we came to an arrangement where it wouldn't infringe on the religious side, but would give some freedom to the secular side. That was the novelty of having religious people sitting together with very secular people and trying to solve these problems. That's what we need to get to in Israel. To have this clash against each other will get nowhere. It'll just increase tensions. We won't have any solutions. But if we're willing to be uh, courageous enough to sit together and both sides make some compromises we'll get somewhere on these issues you know I'm looking at the situation and I'm you know usually uh, football sports should not be uh, able or should not get into all these uh, clashes and politics and that it's but it's always like that uh, well, honey. Celtic, How come? Celtic Rangers would not agree with that uh, neither would <laughs> Atletico Bilbao well, neither would Barcelona yeah. and so on and so forth um, football, uh, an article I wrote about this will come out in, in the next few uh, days. Football is always entrenched in politics. This is not the United States. It's not the American football uh, that has a completely different notion. Um, what you see mostly, and in Israel in more particular way, because most of the clubs were affiliated with political parties. Beitar Jerusalem with the Likud, Hapoel Tel Aviv with the Labour, and so on and so forth. The notion is that what we see right now, and I should say that because Dov is kind of like implementing on that um, and hinting to that, this is not just about football on Saturday. This is a whole different issue. Yeah. This is about the nature of the Jewish state. And you haven't said a word yes. about the Muslims, 
about the Christians. You haven't said a word about atheists. You're only talking about Jews, secular versus religious. Where are all the other groups? What should we do with them? They don't have a problem with uh, Shabbat. I know, but this, the issue of the state being Jewish has an, some kind of um, a bearing on their way of living. Because if you think about the state being only Jewish state, what about other minorities? This whole discussion that we're dealing with leaves them outside the picture. It's a twofold discussion we never had. David Ben Gurion stood up and declared a Jewish and democratic state. Mm -hmm. We never defined what does part one mean? What is Jewish? What is a Jewish state? And we never figured out how do you balance Jewish with democratic with everyone else? And this issue, maybe because football, soccer is so important to us, maybe this will force us to have the discussion even further. So I think first step, first step is, is um, enlarging the weekend, adding the Sunday to the weekend. That will solve a lot of issues. Which, by the way, the Muslim issue is an issue because yes. CEOs of companies told me, but we have uh, Muslim workers we give off on Friday, Friday to. Friday, yes. So how do we balance the two? These are major issues that's not as simple as people might think it should be. It's never easy in this country, no. huh? Nah. <laughs> this is why it's so much fun. I, yeah, I would have liked to see both of you like the nah. <laughs> we'll come back next week with, with a solution to the problem. Yeah, yes. yeah. Uh, gentlemen, thank you very, very thank much for Thank you for, for having us. Thank you. Right football fans, both of you. And uh, now to a controversial new documentary film about one man's uh, a pilgrimage to the holy Muslim city of Mecca. The film brings footage from inside the journey despite Saudi laws forbidding cameras in the city. But as Ayman Siksik explains, this is not the only reason the Saudi kingdom is outraged by this film. More in the next report. Three days I leave for Saudi Arabia. This is a story about faith. I'm going there to complete my Hajj pilgrimage, just like millions of Muslims before me have. A story about identity. The only difference with my Hajj is that I'm going there as a openly gay man. And about the price one man pays for both. An act that is punishable by death. Indian-born filmmaker Parvez Sharma is stirring controversy in Saudi Arabia with a new documentary about his personal pilgrimage to Mecca, the capital of the Saudi Kingdom's Mecca region and the holiest city in Islam. But Sharma's depiction of it is anything but holy. The film, A Sinner in Mecca, purports to show the less documented side of the Muslim pilgrimage, the extreme conditions often faced by worshippers and the tight security measures imposed by Saudi authorities. And as he explained at the Hot Docs International Documentary Film Festival in Canada, the reaction from the public too has been overwhelming. We've just been public for about four weeks and uh, we've had an enormous amount of hate mail um, that is coming in reaction to us putting the trailer online and launching the film website. Making the film was also an extraordinary experience. Filming in Mecca is strictly prohibited and Sharma had to document his journey in secret using his mobile phone. But having been caught by Saudi police, Sharma says he was beaten and his footage confiscated. Ahead of its premiere in New York this Friday, the film is already attracting worldwide attention, partly because of its candid depiction of Sharma's gay and Muslim identities. The film also includes footage of his wedding to his American partner. Iranian and Pakistani websites are already condemning the trailer, which quickly went viral in the Muslim world as promoting what they call disgusting acts of homosexuality. But Sharma insists his film is an exploration of the crisis of Islam and how the religion has changed under extremist forces, forces for whom he has now become another target. Wow. Uh, wow. Uh, correspondent and author Ayman Siksik is here with me. Good evening, Lucy. Well, I would like to talk about that, but you're coming to, <laughs> to speak about something else. A sharp uh, transition. <laughs> really sharp transition. Um, we're talking about uh, the F word feelings. That's right. Um, we can't mention the title of the book, but our viewers can clearly see behind you yes. the title. Mm -hmm. And already you can get a clear picture 
about what this book is generally speaking of. It's a self-help book, essentially. Self-help book? Self-help book. Okay. It's a multi-million dollar industry, bringing in millions to many, many people every year. But it's mocking the self-help books that we know and some of us love and telling us basically if we have feelings that we're obsessed about. We need to stop thinking why we feel this way, what made us feel this way, exploring our feelings and talking about them, and just say... You're take just th saying that and I'm getting tired. <laughs> <laughs> why? How? But you know, these questions are usually... Um, women are asking... Uh, no, I'm not going to be stereotyped. But, you know, uh, usually men are saying that women are exploring too much of the emotions. Let's sit down, let's talk about how we feel, let's talk about the relationship, let's talk, let's talk, let's talk, and we forget the common sense. That's right. Well, maybe that's why he wrote the book with his daughter, who's a comedian. Oh. He has the female perspective in there. And you know what's interesting? It's true that many people think that it's women who do this, but what we see is that the self-help industry, like even for people like Oprah, who do this in books and in magazines and documents, Dr. Phil and so on, it really has taught us in a way to be babies and focus on our feelings. And it's made us think that happiness is not a spontaneous reaction that can occur naturally. It's a task that we need to master and we need someone to tell us how to do it, so how to be happy. So what, what, what is the solution? To stop talking about our feelings and just to start being rational? Well, he does encourage us to be na uh, rational, more rational. He does believe in feelings. He says they are important, but he says we've become obsessed with them. We're dependent we, on our we feelings. Are. We are obsessed with our feelings. And we let them dictate our everyday lives and how we feel, which is a very infantile thing to do. This is how children act. And we've regressed to the emotional state of children in dealing with our problems. And what he's saying is, just take the approach of the title of the book, be rational, and deal with your feelings in a more C constructive way. So what do you do with the kid inside of you that uh, all the, let's say, uh, psychiatrists are telling us to uh, keep him alive? Well, you need to be in, in touch with the kid inside of you, but don't let the kid inside of you tell you how to live your own life and dictate your actions, which is something that we've learned to do because feelings have become sacred. If you feel a certain way, then you must talk about it, then you must express it, and it might be even true. Well, what he's telling us it's true that you may feel uh, a certain way, but it has nothing to do with reality most of the time. So most get a time. grip, get over it, and let's move on. Get over it. <laughs> That's it. How do you feel about uh, the edition tonight? Uh, I feel very rational about it. I think it was a very good edition, rationally. <laughs> rationally, it was a good edition. Uh, I feel that uh, we need to... Uh, close this edition because this edition is ending. Oh, it's good that they, they don't see the title because if they saw the title. And the, that's it for tonight from the Jaffa Port Israel. Have a great night and just F word on the feeling and just live your lives, right? Yeah, this is what I mean. Good night. <laughs>